take it away. Hi, I'm Shep Zaleski, and we're interviewing Dan Strauss, uh, incumbent for uh, City Council District 6. And Amanda will ask the first question. Oh, did you, was there an opening oh, statement? I'm sorry, no? yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Could you make your opening statement, please? Yeah, sure. Let me start my timer here. So I'm Dan Strauss. I'm the current council member for District 6, representing Fremont, Finney, Green Lake, Greenwood, Crown Hill, Ballard, many other micro neighborhoods. I'm a proud Democrat, and I'm excited to have Magnolia back in my district. I say back because I used to work for Sally Bagshaw on the issues of the Magnolia Bridge, Smith Cove Park, and many others. In my first six months in office, I was faced with a, a pandemic, an international pandemic, a global recession, uh, civil rights reckoning, and civil unrest. One of those things individually would knock a normal person down. I never quit working for District 6 because we don't quit in District 6. Uh, I have a District 6 office at the Ballard Library because it's important to me that folks don't have to go out of their way to have their voice heard at City Hall. In this campaign, three things are most important to me, and that's addressing public safety, homelessness, and housing. Public safety, I've fully funded a hiring and staffing plans every year I've been in office. My amendment this last year brought the council budget in line with the Mayor, Mayor Harrell's proposal and fully funded our recruitment program. I have task for, public safety task forces across District 6 implementing real-time solutions by working with small businesses, residents, and the departments that implement these, these services, these solutions. Regarding homelessness, I in my first year in office, I put D6 specific outreach workers in place. This helped us address the Ballard Commons and Woodland Park encampments without sweeps by using censuses, needs assessments, and the time to get people inside. I've also worked with Mayor Harrell to move our, uh, our teams to expand and scale up our homelessness teams to be neighborhood-based. We have just started doing this and we're already seeing success. Regarding housing, I've streamlined design review for permanent supportive and, and affordable housing. We've changed our, our programming to also include rapid acquisition. So we're not just building our way out of this crisis. We're also buying our way out of this crisis. And I've made sure that we've funded affordable housing at $200 million per Two year. Oh, I'm hearing my blank here. Uh, better's, things are better and better is not good enough. I want neighborhoods that are safer than the one that I grew up in. I was born and raised in our community and I see where we've come from. And I see the horizon that has a brighter future than we have today. Thank you. Amanda, would you like to ask the first question? Yep. What steps will you take to ensure the city remains safe for all, including Black, Indigenous, and LGBTQIA plus people, and keep the police accountable to elected leadership and community? Yeah. And so when you say safe for Black, Indigenous, and LGBTQIA plus communities, the way we do this is con uh, for me to continue working with the chief of police to ensure that Black, Indigenous, and LGBTQIA plus communities are part of the, the For the Badge program, which is, in pro, which is working today. This is where recruits come and meet with Seattleites, walk the walk with officers before they go to the state academy. This program already is ensuring that these voices are being heard and that officers that don't share Seattle's values aren't ultimately hired, which has already worked. To be accountable, this is meaning having strong relationships with the police department, which I do have with both the chief of police and line officers. And having those strong relationships allows me to say what is working well, what's not working well. And if I don't have those strong relationships, there's not a place that we can work together. I have these strong relationships because I've worked with uh, Chief Diaz for many years. And my District 6 office is held at the Ballard Service Center, which is also where there's a North Precinct uh, substation. So I'm able to work with both the brass and the line officers. And if my face is getting too blurry, maybe I'll switch back over this way. Okay. Jim, would you like to ask the second question? Hi. Yeah. Um, how would you ensure the city has an updated climate action plan and what specific actions would you prioritize to get us back on track to meeting Seattle's Green New Deal goals? Yeah, this is a great question. So number one is continue to work 
with the Green New Deal Oversight Board because they're the ones that are really in charge of oversight. And, and it's important to have everyday people part of these solutions. In this last uh, two years, I tried to bring forward a select committee on climate crisis because it is not just what is in the Green New Deal that is important for us to be able to address the climate crisis as the crisis it is today. This is important important because we have programs, plans across many different departments and across many different committees. And so having a select committee on the climate crisis allows all council members to be present to understand where the issues are, you know, building codes, transportation, uh, in, in economic development, all of these different places have parts of our climate solutions, uh, have, have solutions for the climate crisis. And when they're in different departments, uh, committees, it's hard to track them all. I was proud to pass the greenest energy code in the nation uh, in the last few years, and I'm excited to do more. Jasmine, would you like to ask the third question? Yeah. Uh, the Move Seattle levy is set to expire at the end of 2024. The next nine-year trans or transportation levy will go before the voters in November 2024 to begin in 2025. What investments and improvements would you prioritize for the next transportation levy? Oh my gosh, this is so important to having the city that we need, the future, the city, the future of our city, is because we need more Vision Zero improvements. The list that I have from my, I hold weekly office hours for in District Six. The list of places that people want crosswalks, roundabouts, stop signs can't fit on one page. And so we need to have more dollars funding Vision Zero improvements. We need to expand our safe streets program that allows our streets to, to prioritize people walking and biking and sharing that urban vibrant urban space together. We need to create safe pedestrian crossings and slow traffic in neighborhoods. This is essential in the next transportation levy. Again, I can't tell you how many requests I have for people that just want folks to drive slower in their neighborhoods. We also need to vastly improve the pedestrian connections in and out of the brewery district that to connect to Ballard and Fremont. When you look at the brewery district, it's cut off by four high stress level streets, Market, Leary, 15th and 8th. This is why it's hard for people to walk or bike in this area. We need to have a city that is vibrant and connects all of our places. Most importantly, we need to complete the missing link of the Burke Gilman Trail. I, you may have seen my proposal uh, that I think can move forward. And what we know is even with the current amount of funding that, that SDOT has, they can't complete a, a, a line along Shell Shoal. So we need to have more money for the Burke Gilman Trail missing link. And of course, outside of my district, we need to be funding safety improvements for both Aurora and Rainier Avenues. And this is a priority of mine that I wanna see addressed. And Barbara, can you ask the fourth question? Yes, thank you. Uh, Dan, the city has been in a homelessness state of emergency since 2015, <clears throat> yet our homeless crisis has not receded. What are we doing wrong? And what steps will you take to address the crisis? Yeah. Thank you. This is a really important question. Number one, we were the city was given a goal of uh, hitting to, uh, funding affordable housing at two hundred million dollars a year. This this benchmark was set in twenty seventeen, and it wasn't until I came to office that we started doing this. This is number one most important to get people into a stabilized, permanent place to live. Uh, the regional homelessness authority was delayed in starting up due to the pandemic and other factors. They are now skipping shelter, which means that we can focus on just getting people into housing. This is incredibly important. And while we are building and buying our way uh, into having the housing stock that we need, we still need to have non-congregate shelter that meets people's needs so they can be as a couple, they can have a pet. What I found in addressing homelessness is that each person has different needs and we need to have shelter situations that work for these folks. What I found uh, working on the Ballard Commons and Woodland Park encampment resolutions, this, these resolutions changed the way that the city was addressing homelessness because before we were just using 72 hours, one size fits all shelter. People didn't trust the outreach workers. They didn't trust that the shelter options were safe. 
when we took the time to build a census of who was living there, a needs assessment of what they needed, and took the time to get them into the shelter that met their needs, we found a drastic uh, increase in the number of people accepting shelter. We went from pre-pandemic where very few people were accepting shelter to just recently with the encampment resolution under the I-5 bridge that had 100% shelter acceptance. This, so number one, we haven't been uh, investing in the housing stock that we've needed. Number two, we were focusing on too much on congregate shelter. We need non-congregate options. And number three, we weren't building the trust that people need by understanding who they are, what they need, and taking the time to get them to a stabilized place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now take follow-up questions. Um, in your response, uh, you'll have a minute to respond to each um, question, and we'll do that as long as we can. Jeremy. Great. Um, I wanted to follow up on that move Seattle question that you, uh, that you, um, the answer you had, you had mentioned that there were a lot of requests and we just simply didn't have funds for a lot of it. Um, I know that one, uh, one current project that's supposed to, we're supposed to start working on this summer, the repaving of 15th Avenue, including the Ballard Bridge. Um, one complaint, and this has been addressed on the project page, and was that it was not adding any new bike infrastructure and, um, you know, using Move Seattle funds. So how, how on the next Move Seattle will we ensure that we aren't just spending we aren't just spending this money that was advertised as sort of helping, helping uh, non, you know, I know it wasn't precluding road improvements, but it was advertised as helping a lot of transit and bike projects. How will we ensure that it doesn't just end up getting used to repave highways? Yeah, number one, uh, I would say take a look at the uh, transportation committee uh, from about a month or so ago where Vision Zero was presenting uh, their current report because SDOT in the last six to nine months has taken a drastic shift in how they approach projects just like 15th Avenue. In that committee meeting, you hear me directly ask SDOT director Greg Spots about why things are, did not, why 15th Avenue repaving didn't include some of these things. And his response was very uh, helpful in saying, since the shift has happened within SDOT, they are taking a new look at the way things are going. I have been completely, it has been, it has been so important to me to get additional safe crossings across 15th, especially at 51st, to create that connectivity across high stress level streets. When I say high stress level, that means cars are moving fast, people don't have the space or the infrastructure to be protected as they cross these, one these high stress level places. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I can't see any timers. No, so just, no problem. Just interrupt no problem. me. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Pat, your turn. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I have a follow-up question about, uh, I suppose it'd be related to public safety, but um, correct me if I am wrong here, but um, our 911 system had been within the SPD and either we're either shifting it, either has been shifted or we're in the process of shifting it um, to uh, civilian uh, administration um can you please explain again if, if i'm wrong please correct me but um can you explain why you think that's in um the public interest to have the, the 911 out of you know spd and into something um you know independent or civ uh, civilian without uh having prepped for this question i don't have the exact report's name in front of me but there was a report that was done in i believe 2018 that actually recommended this change and this is this is an important change because as 911 call center is when it was in SPD, you would have lieutenants rotating through, which did not create a consistent uh, person in charge to know how things are getting better, how things are going work, if things are getting worse, and to be able to uh, work both with other departments, civilians, and others. So this change was consistent with an outside report that the city received in, I believe, 2018 or 2019. Um, and this is really important for us to be able to integrate all other types of responses ten, ten into our 911 call center because previously we relied too much on police attending to every problem in our in our community. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I've got a timer now. Let me. I get. I don't know. Yeah. 
hopefully I'm going to be better if I've got my own time now. Great. Uh, Toby, your turn. Uh, hey, Dan. Uh, Want to talk asking, about trees, Toby? Nope, I'm not. <laughs> uh, I'm asking okay. this follow-up question of all city council candidates. So it's not just about that. Inclusionary housing is explicitly allowed by the recently passed state level mission middle zoning bill to help ensure production of more low income housing at every community. How would you support using it in Seattle? Yeah, so as you know, Toby, uh, since we work together in the land use committee, that we have a lot of different steps that have to take place before uh, any changes can be made to our city. What is important to me is that we retain duplexes, quads, triplexes to have them fit the character of our neighborhood. We have over 800 different duplexes, triplexes, and quads in District 6 today that are in neighborhood residential zones where they would not be able to be built today. And this was because duplexes, triplexes, and quads were allowed to be built until the 1980s. What we need to do in the next year or so is really come up with a strong form-based code to make sure that these buildings fit the character of our neighborhood because the, the only difference between a, a quad and a McMansion is that there's internal walls. When you look at a, a, a McMansion, they've got six different doors coming out of a very large house. The only difference from what I hope to One see minute. is that there's internal walls uh, so that four families can live in that building as well. Yeah, my, my timer's not working as well as I thought it was. Sorry, guys. No Just problem. keep interrupting me. No <laughs> Barbara. Thank you. Dan, um, in addition to the committees that you serve on and uh, the work that you're doing, can you tell us what your highest priority, new, I mean, new priority would be uh, going forward now? Are you... Um, focusing additionally or in addition to something that we might not have heard about yet? That's a great question, Barbara. Number one, it's continuing to address public safety. It's continuing to make progress on, on homelessness and really building the affordable housing that we need. I know I've already talked about that, but what we have in District 6 is strong momentum because of my relationships with the mayor's office. And it comes from me laying the groundwork in our district so that when the mayor's team has capacity to start expanding this work, the, I've already laid the work. Additionally, and underpinning all of this is my District 6 specific work meeting with residents every week during office hours, being present in my district office that has three glass walls. I'll tell you, there's nothing more that's government transparency than that. And it's really being present to know the needs of our community and then to be able to effectuate change to meet those needs. Thank you. And uh, Jeremy, last question. Hey, uh, you had mentioned in one of your previous answers, um, neighborhood character. Uh, would you yeah. like to talk a little bit more about that and how that, or things like design review and how that interacts with our climate action plan? Or with our climate our action goals plan? in general? Well, our climate goals in general. Um, can you be a or, little bit more you, specific you know what, about here, neighborhood? I'll, yeah. You know, sorry, I'll, let me back up a little bit. Just just talk a little bit about what you meant by neighborhood character and um and you know if you could maybe touch on design review a little bit um okay so neighborhood character to me means uh, you know looking like the community what i have found is that the duplexes triplexes and quads that were legal until the 1980s look like our community much more than the mcmansions that were built for a very long time when i see a you know a small house that has already been built be demolished to be replaced by a McMansion that serves only one family as well. There's a waste there. There's a waste in our climate goals because we're using new materials. There's a waste there because um, it, we're rebuilding a structure and it doesn't serve more families. Now regarding design review, it is broken in two different ways. Number one, it's broken because it doesn't give community members the ability to actually have changes made that meet their needs and it is weaponized to slow down projects that build the housing that we that we critically need in our community. And so while the solution to those two issues is That's not clear. No, you can, you can finish. Uh, well, yeah, sorry, the, while the solutions uh, to those issues are not clear, 
those are the two clear things to me about why design review is broken. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, I, I, I caught there where you were talking about climate at the very end once I started talking. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> I apologize. That was kind no, of a, fine. Yeah, a tricky question. But um, yeah, so I think that's, um, yeah, that's the end of our uh, 20 minutes. So um, yes, yeah, so I guess um, 